This video is the first in a series that we're going to have on correlation and regression tests. So we'll start with correlation, and I'll explain what both of these are in a minute. And specifically, we're going to start with the Pearson product moment correlation, also called Pearson's R. So far in this course, we've considered tests that are designed for one continuous measurement in predetermined categories, or for discrete counts in one or more categories. But what if you want to test for an association between two continuous variables instead? Or whether one continuous variable can be used to predict a different one? So for example, you might have questions like, do finer sediments have more organic carbon? Or is there a relationship between potassium and strontium contents of granite? Or are growth rates faster at higher temperatures? Well, I mean, one possibility, you know, why not just divide one of the continuous variables into sort of arbitrary categories and then do a t-test or an over mammoth u test or whatever on the other values. You know, maybe we could cut median grain size here on the x-axis into two categories, one less than six units and one greater than six units. And within those two categories, we could perform a t-test on the continuous values of the organic carbon content. Well, the problem with that is that it's too ambiguous. You know, how many groups should we make? Where should we draw the boundaries? Different choices in terms of that might actually give you different results for the statistical test. It's just not very satisfying to remove data by binning things into categories. So because of those issues, there are specific tests that have been designed for this sort of comparison between two continuous variables. And there are two types of methods that are that use these continuous data. One is called correlation and one is called regression. So both compare two continuous variables, but they have different goals and purposes. So correlation is used to test for just an association between the two variables. It makes no assumption about whether one variable is dependent on, another, on the other. There's no assumption that changes in one variable are actually causing changes in the other. The variables may in fact be interdependent, you know, both being forced or driven by changes in something else. In contrast, regression, particularly linear regression, which we'll cover in a, a later video, is used when you think there is a causal effect. So you're attempting to describe the dependence of one variable on the other explanatory variable. So one variable causes and explains changes in the other. You would also use regression if your goal is to predict. So you want to predict one variable, which we call the dependent variable, from the independent variable. So I'll discuss more about this in the video on linear regression. Okay, so we, we need some way to measure the degree of association between two variables. Right? As one increases, does the other also increase? How closely do they change together? We'll start with something called covariance. So you've learned about variance before, and covariance is indeed related to it, as, as we'll see. Covariance is just a measure of how much two variables change together. As one increases, does the other variable increase by the same amount? So it's calculated um, as something called the sum of products divided by the degrees of freedom. So to get the sum of products, each point is normalized by subtracting the mean value for that variable. So we get x by minus x bar, where x bar is a sample mean for x. And you do that for each point in x, and you do that for each point in y, you multiply them together. Um, and then you add that all up, and you get the sum of products. So as an aside, um, variance is just the covariance of a variable with itself. right? So instead of x minus x bar times y minus y bar, we just have x minus x bar times x minus x bar, or x minus x bar squared, which is the sum of squares that you saw about variance. However, there's one downside with covariance, at least for this purpose that we're, we're trying to use it for here. Its magnitude depends on the scale of the variables, so it's not ideal for comparisons between different data sets. So as an example, these three data sets here all define a linear trend. You just can't get a stronger association between two variables. As the x increases by 1, the y also increases by 1. Perfect line in all of them. However, the covariance of the left panel is 1.667, the middle panel has a covariance of 2.5, and the right has a covariance of 3.5, even though they're all perfect lines. 
So what we really want is a scale independent measure to quantify this association or correlation or interdependence. So I've included the same three examples here with their covariances. But if we look at the left panel, the standard deviation of each variable, both x and y, is 1.291, it turns out. And if you multiply those two together, the product of the standard deviations, the standard deviation of x multiplied by the standard deviation of y, is 1.667. In the middle panel here, the product of the standard deviations is 2.5 and it's 3.5 in the right-hand panel. So you see that in these examples where the points describe a perfect line, the covariance is the same as the product of standard deviations. So that's Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient r. So r is just the covariance of the two variables divided by the product of their standard deviation. And it ranges, or r can range from minus 1, which is a perfect negative correlation, a perfect line sloping downward. So as x increases by 1, y decreases by 1. And it, so it can range from minus 1 through 0, which is no correlation, to positive 1, which is a perfect positive correlation. So the graphs at the bottom just illustrate two made-up data sets. The one on the, the left has a fairly strong positive correlation, r of 0.59, that's pretty strong. And on the left, there's a pretty weak negative correlation, an r of minus 0.21. So in order to perform statistical hypothesis testing, we have to frame this question as a null hypothesis, of course. So testing for a statistically significant correlation, testing whether r is significant or not, requires that we have two independent continuous variables, as we've already seen. So the purpose is to test for an association. We're not assuming any causal relationship. With the, and our null hypothesis is that there is no association between the two variables. So Pearson's correlation is a parametric method. So it requires that both variables are normally distributed. And it also requires that the relationship between the two is linear. So if the null hypothesis is true, we expect that R should be 0. Zero means no correlation or no association, and that's our null hypothesis. However, of course, you know, the, the observations are just random samples from the population, so, you know, they can randomly differ a little bit, and the actual correlation might be a little bit different from zero, even if the null hypothesis is true, just because we have this random fluctuations. So we need to know, you know, the probability of obtaining a particular outcome, you know, how much can R differ from zero before we get the null hypothesis? We need to get the p-value, the probability of obtaining an outcome at least as extreme as observed in the case where the null hypothesis is true. So Pearson determined that at least as long as both variables are normally distributed, the correlation coefficient r can be converted to a t-statistic that then follows the t-distribution that we heard about before, this case with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. So we can then calculate our p-value from that new t-statistic. So I mentioned the assumptions before, but to reiterate, the relationship between the variables can't be nonlinear, right? It doesn't have to be a line, right? There can be a, there can be no relationship. There can be just a cloud of points, but it can't be a, a nonlinear relationship. And both variables have to be normally distributed. This is applies to the p-value technically only because it is, deals with the conversion to the t-statistic. As you're doing these tests, be cautious that the, the method can be quite sensitive to outliers, points that are you know, anomalously far away from the rest of the points. And I like, quite like this comic from XKCD, you know, and then this phrase, correlation impl doesn't imply causation, um, is really widespread. It actually has its own Wikipedia page just for that phrase. However, you know, correlation can be a, often a good clue for causation, even though, of course, it's not proof. But as long as you have a mechanism that can explain the relationship, you know, correlation does sort of give you some hints about what might be causing changes in the other. So when you're reporting the results of a correlation test, you should probably also include a scatter plot, like I've shown in this video, you know, the various graphs that I've included here, that shows the data. But don't fit a trend line to it because we're not trying to look at linear relationships. We're just trying to see if there's any association. You should describe the type of test you did, the value of the correlation coefficient, which is r in this case, and the p-value. 
So you report the correlation coefficient, its, its value, because that's a measure of the strength of association. The p-value tells you something indirectly about how likely that association is to be non-random, but doesn't really tell you anything about how strong it is, because the p-value is also a factor of sample size, as we've mentioned sort of for previous tests as well. So really like the R is a measure of how strong the association is. So that's sort of when you're making your interpretations very important. The p-value, you know, also important in terms of whether that's likely to be to be random chance or not. So the R function for correlation is called COR.test and it requires two numeric vectors as inputs. So X and Y in this example here. They must be the same length uh, but they don't have doesn't matter what order you put them in because you're just testing for association. If you do x comma y or y comma x, you'll get the same correlation coefficient, the same p-value. The output will look like this. It gives it a fair amount of information, but the key pieces are the name of the test at the top, the correlation coefficient r, which is given at the bottom as the sample estimate cor. That's actually r in this case. So that's what you should report and it gives the p-value, uh, it's kind of up in the, the middle there. You don't need to report the t-statistic or the degrees of freedom, it gives you those, but those are not as important. The correla correlation coefficient r is very important. Um, and the 95% the confidence interval that's listed here is the confidence interval on the correlation coefficient r. But again, you don't need to report that. So just report the test name, the r, the correlation coefficient r, and the p-value.